the, the, Master's a little bit of a controversial book. It has a kind of a history of controversy. In the very early church and uh, even before uh, Jesus, the, as the Jewish people would read their scriptures, Esther was always a book that the rabbis would debate over. And the reason they would debate over it is because there's no mention of the book of God in the book of Esther. The name of God or the word God isn't even used throughout the book of Esther. And it caused some people, maybe they were thinking they were pious or whatever, is to say, well, why would this be in our Bible then if it doesn't even talk about God? And the reason it's, it, it, it's in our Bible is because it's supposed to be there, but um, God, although he's not mentioned specifically within the pages of Esther, he's clearly at work throughout the whole thing. And the, the reason this is so important to us is because this is how God works, I think, a lot of times in our own, in our own lives. A lot of times our lives feel the same way. Maybe God is not right there in your face. He's not, uh, you know, obviously speaking things to us and he doesn't show up out of the clouds, but he's clearly at work behind the scenes. And the problem is, we want God to show up in those big obvious ways, don't we? We want God to show up in the big bombastic ways. We, we prefer, whenever we have to make a decision in our lives, for the heavens to split open and Yahweh to step down on his throne and say, I want you to do this. And you say, okay, thank you, God. Uh, I pray that way often where I'm, I'm faced with a tough decision to make and I'm not really sure which direction I want to go. And I say, God, which way do you want me to go? Which way, which direction do you want me to take? And it's difficult, isn't it, when we don't hear an answer, when, all of a, when it feels like God's not saying either one. God, which direction do you want me to take? Uh, the hard thing in life is we do need to act. We do need to make decisions. We do need to continue on with our life. Uh, go on with our lives. We can't just sit and do nothing, but we don't always know what to do, which action to take, which direction to look to. And uh, we keep looking for God to show up, and what happens when he doesn't? What happens when we don't hear anything? Well, we either, as, as Christ followers, sometimes, uh, and I see this happen both ways, when, God, when we're not sure which direction God wants us to take, we either uh, will end up paralyzed and not do anything and not act and not go anywhere, uh, because we're afraid to make the wrong decision, or we just take matters into our own hands, and we just do, and we kind of maybe jump into things uh, when we maybe shouldn't have. We act rashly, because we need to take care of ourselves. We think, well, I don't know where God is or what he wants me to do, but I definitely need to take care of myself. And when we jump into those uh, decisions, well, neither one of those feels like a good decision, does it? To just, one, to sit back and not do anything, and two, to just jump into things and uh, make decisions and kind of take things into our own hands. None of those feel like, a, neither of those feel like a good decision. I remember, and I've shared this story once, and I was trying to think of any other story to tell except this one, but this is the only one that came to my head. Um, I remember as uh, we lived in a, a trailer when Crystal and I were first married, and we were living in this trailer park, and uh, all the trailers were hooked up to this uh, sewer pipe that kind of ran under all the trailers. And you'll forgive me if you've heard this story before. I think I told it one other time. Uh, one day we're sitting in, at night and the, and the sewer pipe got blocked somewhere and sewage is coming up through our toilets and stuff in the trailer. And I start panicking and we, we, you know, we're sitting there watching television and I start smelling something. And we go to the bathroom and realize oh, we've got to do something about this. It's going to spill out everywhere. So I'm getting buckets and kind of just dumping it out the window. And I tell Crystal, I can only do this for a couple more minutes and I'm going to lose my mind. I don't know how, how much longer I can run from bathroom to bathroom dumping out raw sewage. So she calls the plumber and it's late at night and the plumber says, well, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get out there, but here's one thing you could do. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, and I don't recommend this, but there's a, there's a pipe that comes out of your trailer that goes into sewage. You, and if you have the tools, you can just unscrew that pipe and let the pressure out there. And I said, okay, yes, that's what we're going to do. And he says, well, I'll be there in a bit, but uh, if, that, if you want to do that for now. And I said, yes, we have to take care of things right now. I have to take matters into my own hands. And so I get this, uh, I get this uh, wrench and I go out and sure enough, on the outside of the trailer, there's this big pipe that comes and there's a release valve that is off the pipe. And, uh, and I walk up to this pipe and I'm not really sure what I'm doing at all. And the, the pipe's like going like this with all the pressure that's built up. And so I take the wrench and I give it a little turn and, uh, and the top of the thing shoots off and there's this huge geyser of, uh, 
of just gro the grossest sewage you can imagine shoots up everywhere uh, and it shoots even it was higher than the trailer was the the height of this geyser and I'm blasted by this by this stuff and, I, and in my you know naivete I'm like oh I've broke something I need to put this cap back on so I'm like I take the cap and I'm trying to put it over the put it over the release thing and trying to screw it back on and it's squirting everywhere doing everything and uh and crystal's on the phone with the plumber and she <laughs> i don't know what she said but she was like oh oh I, oh poop uh <laughs> which is what it was and uh and so the plumber says, okay, well, I, I guess you took matters in your own hands, but I'll, I got to come down now and I'll, I'll take care of it. And so I'm sitting there drenched in sewage and like, and I don't know if I should keep it on. I don't want it to burst again. But I really, I thought to myself, I should have waited for the plumber <laughs> to come. What am I doing? It's like midnight right now and I'm just covered in sewage and, and I don't really know what I should do. But I took matters into my own hands when maybe it would have been better if I would have just waited for the plumber. But how, you know, what am I supposed to do when, we, when, we, when you come into these, to these decisions and you don't hear a direction either way, uh, what's the best direction to take? I feel like here's, this is what Esther's dealing with. She has to act. If you remember the last couple weeks, we're kind of building up to the climax this week. And the king Xerxes has uh, issued a decree to exterminate all the Jewish people in the land of Persia. And he was coerced into this by uh, his right-hand man, a guy named Haman. And Esther is the queen at this time. Uh, nobody knows she's Jewish. At least the king doesn't know that she's Jewish. And she has got to intercede for her people on behalf of the king. And the problem is, this king's a real hothead. Um, Esther is faced with this decision to make. She says, I've got to go up to the king. And this is what we're going to read today is when she finally confronts the king about this. But I've got to imagine Esther's wondering, what does God want me to do in all this? You remember, God's, his name doesn't appear in the book of Esther, so Esther's kind of in the same predicament we find ourselves in. I've got to do something, I feel like, but what is it, and why isn't God showing up to tell me what to do? And so later, a couple weeks ago, we read that she asks everyone to just pray for her. She goes, pray and fast. I'm going to go into the king, and she says, if I, if I perish, then I perish, but I, you guys better be praying for me. Now, she eventually goes up to the king, and the king uh, allows her to come forward, which is a miracle in itself. Uh, you're not even supposed to approach the king, even if you are the queen. And he extends his scepter to her, which says that she's permitted to speak, and she invites the king and Haman, and Haman's the guy behind this awful decree. He was basically like Hitler. He wanted to exterminate all the Jews, and you can think of him like Hitler. You're, I mean, that's a fair way of thinking about this guy. And she says, I want to invite both of you guys to a banquet tomorrow, and I will, I'll tell you what my request is there. So now here we are at the banquet, and you've got King Xerxes, who's issued this decree that all the Jews are going to be exterminated on this specific day. And the decree was something kind of, it was really weird. It was, if, if you see a Jewish person, you have permission by the king to kill that person, and if you do, you can take all their stuff if you want. You can have their home, their land, whatever they have is yours if you, if you kill them. That was the, basically what the decree says. So here's Esther and the king who ordered this decree, and she also has invited Haman, who is the guy behind it. Uh, Haman, we remember the last couple weeks, he is very concerned about always lifting himself up. He really secretly wants to be king, I think. He, um, he secretly desires to walk around in the king's robes and ride the king's horse, and he can't stand that this guy Mordecai, who is Esther's uncle or cousin who has helped raise Esther, he can't stand that Mordecai won't bow to him. Mordecai is just a faithful Jewish person. He's working in the palace as well. He's trying not to cause any waves, but he's not bowing to Haman, and it just drives Haman nuts. So not only does Haman want to destroy, wipe out all the Jews, he also wants to specifically uh, kill Mordecai. And you remember last week, he erected this giant pole on his property, 75 feet high pole, and the goal was to take Mordecai and impale him on it. And I don't know how he gets up that high. Maybe it's a big ladder. But that was his goal. And uh, you remember last week, his kind of, the plot was foiled because the king wanted to honor Mordecai. And, uh, and yet Haman wanted to kill Mordecai. So this, all, this is all by way of background to bring us where we are today. Now we're all here together, and we're in this uh, banquet hall with the king and with Haman, and now Esther is very nervous because now she's got to confront the king about this horrible decree that he made, and he's got to kind of 
blame, or she's got to tell uh, the king that Haman was behind this whole thing. Haman, who's his, his right-hand man. And she also has to kind of spill the beans that she herself is a Jewish person. So she's, in a, uh, she's ridiculously scared of this moment. She's asked all her people to pray about it. And um, we don't know if she's, if she's heard a word from God or not. She's just kind of acting and walking and stepping out on faith. And we're in a Esther chapter 7. I'm going to go through these verses maybe one at a time here. And it says so th in Esther chapter 7, So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, What is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Now this is a, just a way of speaking, like kind of a, he's a, an exaggerated way of speaking. So Esther's got to uh, bring this up now. And she's nervous because if you remember the last few weeks, the king, he's kind of a rash guy. I mean, he kind of rashly uh, just signs this order that, yeah, all the Jews should be wiped out. Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, you remember at the very beginning of the book, he had a queen before Esther. And he asked the queen to come to his party once, and the queen refused. And he said, okay, I'm going to get a new queen. Like, this is the kind of guy this King Xerxes is. He uh, just has no problem giving these orders to wipe out everybody. Um, all the laws that he writes are irreversible. They can't be uh, revoked. Uh, he kicks out queens. Uh, apparently, he doesn't care for Jewish people. Uh, people can't even approach him without him uh, extending a scepter for the, for the threat of them being uh, beheaded. Uh, he's a very violent guy. And now here Esther is, and she says, okay, I've got, this is the moment that, uh, that I've been praying about. And it says, then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. So she's trying to be very polite here. She's like, if, if, if we were just sold as slaves, I wouldn't bother you. That's, you know, that's, but this is a, a serious business. So she's being cautious about this, and she says, if I found favor with the king, and apparently she has because uh, King Xerxes, when he hears that her people are going to be destroyed, he's outraged about this. And I don't know if he's forgotten that he signed this law or if he d hasn't put two and two together yet that, oh my gosh, my own queen must be a Jewish person. But King Xerxes, either way, he responds in verse 5, says, King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. And Esther said, he's an adversary and an enemy. And then she probably points to Haman, who's also sitting there at the banquet. This vile Haman. It says, then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left the wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Well, let's pray as we uh, continue looking into this. Lord, I pray, that you would, um, I pray that you would just be with us and guide us. And God, I pray for those of us here who don't hear your voice, who don't see your face, who don't know exactly what direction to go. Lord, I pray that as we uh, read these words of Esther and how your servant handled these matters, I pray that we would uh, be open to our own lives uh, be open to your, your direction in our own lives and help us to know how to navigate those waters, know how to navigate those times where we need to make a decision, but yet we don't quite know what to do. And God, I pray that you would be with us and I pray that you would guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this point, it's basically Haman versus Esther. Uh, you've got the king's right-hand man and then you've also got the queen. And the king has to make a decision. Who am I going to trust here? And I think it's interesting. Because uh, Esther just kind of says, hey, your guy Haman did this awful thing. And the king really doesn't need any more convincing than that. That Haman says he could see right, in, he was watching the king's face when the king left in a rage. And he realizes, oh shoot, I, the king has already decided my fate. And so Haman already kind of realizes the king has made, his, made up his mind. Well, 
what, what do you think made the king make up his mind so quickly in this matter? He didn't need any other convincing. He didn't need to bring up court documents or look into the matter. He just kind of knew, oh, yeah, this is something that uh, Haman did. And I think if you look back the last couple weeks and you see everything that Haman has been doing the last couple weeks, uh, at least the last couple weeks in the sermon, this has probably been several months, uh, Haman has been constantly trying to lift himself up. Constantly, he's worried about what others think about him. He's worried about uh, people honoring him. He wants people to think highly of him. And he always is getting in there and trying to lift himself up and trying to push everybody down. And the king knows this about Haman. The king is, is, is very well aware of how Haman acts. And I think the reason the king doesn't need any more convincing is because he knows who Haman is and he knows who Esther is. Esther has found favor in his sight. She's always been humble. She's always been gracious. She's always been respectable. And then here's this other guy who's in the king's court and he's always prideful. He's always puffing himself up. He's always talking about himself. And when you're around people who are always talking about themselves and always want to build themselves up and everything is always about them, don't you just kind of know when you hear from them every time they speak, you think, okay, yeah, they're going to be talking about themselves. And then they talk and you think, okay, yeah, that was about them, sure enough, because it's always about them. And so when, when the king comes to make this decision, he already has this huge background to pull from. He knows who Queen Esther is, and he knows who Haman is, and when he hears this thing that someone accused Haman of doing, he says, yeah, I don't even need to look into it. That sounds exactly like Haman. Uh, he trusts Esther over Haman because he already knows both of them. Uh, he just knows right away. The, we, I'll work with the teens sometime on, on Wednesday night, and uh, the teens are very concerned about all this gossip that goes on in school, you know. If somebody said this about me, and this is one, one of their biggest worries is, uh, this, this person said this about me, and this person said this about me, and it's not true, it's, and I'm worried about this, and now people are going to think this. And I always just say, listen, guys, if your character is good, then your character will speak for itself. If you, ha if you uh, live respectably, and if you're um, uh, honorable, then rumors can go around and people will know right away. People will just know if you're a respectable person and they hear something about you that isn't true, they'll just think in their heads, uh, well, no, that doesn't sound like them. But the teens will say, say, well, yeah, but nobody believes me. Everybody, everybody actually thinks those lies are true. And I always want to say, well, maybe it's because you're not respectable. Maybe it's because people already know how you act. And then when they hear these stories, they think, oh, maybe that is true because they have a history of always puffing themselves up, always being prideful, always uh, not telling the truth. Um, but it's all about your character. We, never, we don't need to go in and, and argue against every piece of gossip and every piece of uh, bad uh, press that's out there against us, arguing against every single thing and making sure nobody's talking bad at us. If we just have a good character and concentrate on being respectable, being honorable, then that character will speak louder than any, than any argument where we try to defend ourselves. Uh, if your character is good, people will know it. Uh, but if you're always talking about yourself, if you're always lifting yourself up, what happens is, and you guys all know this to be true, uh, just picture that person who is, it's, everything is always about them. They're always talking about themselves, talking about how amazing they are. Uh, in your minds, don't you just, isn't it just human nature to kind of put them, take them down a couple notches as they're talking about themselves? Don't you just, isn't it almost a reaction to think, well, yeah, you're not that awesome. You're not that good. Uh, things aren't really always about you. Uh, that's what people do when, we, when you hear that stuff. Whether good or bad, uh, people actually will put you down in their minds if you're always trying to lift yourself up. But the opposite is also true. If you're humble, if you're, let's just live a quiet, respectable, peaceable life, people actually want to cheer you on and want to lift you up. They, they have a kind of a desire to do that. Uh, if people are talking about you and you're, you're worried about what other people think about you, like I said, the best thing you can do is just live a respectable life and let that, let that character argue for you, but not get uh, dragged down and into all these arguments and worried about what other people think. And so the king here, King Xerxes, he knows Esther and he knows Haman and he says, uh, yeah, I know exactly the situation here. Uh, es Haman's accused of something and the king says, yeah, that sounds like something exactly like what Haman would do. But Esther, throughout the whole book, has been uh, giving out and living out this kind of godly character. And 
we have a problem here when we, when we run into these decision, uh, decision moments in our life. We have to decide which way to go and which way to do, uh, which thing to do. And there's always a temptation to be like Haman, where we take matters into our own hands and we lift ourselves up and we, we bolster ourselves and we want to do whatever is right for us. And maybe we feel like we have to do that because we're not sure what, where God is. And if God's not going to take care of us, at least, at least I have to do something about it. And we, we even have a saying, um, God helps those who help themselves. We have this kind of saying. And in fact, some people think that that's a biblical saying. And the problem is, it's not anywhere found in the Bible. Did you know that phrase isn't in the Bible? God helps those who help themselves. That phrase, I was doing a little bit of research on that phrase. It comes from Aesop's fables. There's, a, there's a, an old fable where this guy is praying to Hercules. His wagon is stuck in the mud. Here's this guy, his wagon is stuck in the mud, and he prays to Hercules. He says, oh, Hercules, you're a strong god. Can you help, help me get this wagon out? And Hercules answers and says, do it yourself. And the moral of the story, if you know Aesop's fables, it says the moral is God helps those who help themselves, or the gods help those who help themselves. That's kind of where the idea comes from. In the Bible, uh, the Bible talks a lot about hard work. Be a hard worker. Be a good worker. Uh, you know, work hard with your hands. Um, but in regards to God, more often than not, the phrase in the Bible is God helps the helpless. He helps those who can't help themselves. Uh, that's God's heart. And so here Esther is. She's, she's needing to act. She's knowing she has to do something. And she has, the good thing about Esther is she has all her character, all her respectable character, uh, to back her up with all of this. And this really is one of the main keys to the whole book of Esther. Because we are constantly worried about which direction we should take. Which decision do we need to make? That's the stuff that we tend to pray about when we pray to God. Uh, God, should I go over here or should I go over here? Should I do this or should I do that? And before all that happens, before any decision uh, needs to be made, and even more importantly than any of those decisions, God is interested in our character. He's interested in who we are as people. We're the ones who worry about which direction we should take in life, but God is constantly worried about how we conduct ourselves. Not necessarily which direction we go, but how you conduct yourselves. Even in exile, God says, uh, and we've been talking about how Esther is living in exile and how we're, it's looking more and more like we're also living in exile here now too as the people of God. And even in exile, God says, before you go worrying about the government or worrying about your oppression or worrying about everyone else or worrying about uh, all these people that you're around, don't forget about yourself. I'm, I'm more interested in who you are in your character. The book of 1 Peter in the New Testament uh, has an interesting opening. And it's written by Peter, who was the, the kind of the top apostle of Jesus, maybe the, the, if you could say, the closest apostle to Jesus. And Peter's writing to the church, uh, to several churches throughout the Roman region. And it says in the very opening of 1 Peter, this is a letter from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And it's to, it's written to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I think it's interesting that as Peter writes this letter to the church, he says, I'm writing to God's people who are exiles in all these, in all these places. And I think the, the first interesting thing is that the church, got us, God's people, were always supposed to have thought of themselves as being exiles in this old world. Um, later in the letter, Peter calls us foreigners and aliens. We're exiles. And the point is, no matter where you are located in the world, no matter what country you're in, you are exiles if you're following God. Why? Because when we follow Jesus, we sign up for God's kingdom. We don't sign up to, I mean, we're still living in the worldly kingdoms, but ultimately our allegiance is to God's kingdom. And so Peter says, the church is the exiled people. We're the foreigners and the aliens. And it was always supposed to be that way, no matter what country we're in. You're in, what, you're in, you're in no matter whether you're in Pontus or Galatia or Cappadocia or any of those places, you're exiles because you belong to another kingdom. Now, 1 Peter is a, is a very small letter. I encourage you to read it. It's all about how to live in exile, what God wants to tell people who are living in exile. And the whole book, I just wrote the headings of the book, 
And uh, the, like the NIV and your Bible translations will have little headings over like maybe every paragraph. And here's the headings of 1 Peter. Uh, this is what God is concerned to say to people who are in exile. The headings are about being holy, living godly lives in a pagan society, suffering for doing good, living for God, suffering for being a Christian, and uh, directions to the elders of the church and the rest of the church. But it's interesting that this book, which is about living in exile, is all about how your character is to be lived out. It's not about, here's our plan. Here's how we take things down. Here's how, we, um, uh, here's how you defend yourselves. Here's how you overthrow the government. It's all about, uh, what does God want you to do when you live in exile? He wants you to be a good husband. There's a whole section in 1 Peter about being a good husband. He wants you to be a good wife. There's a whole section in 1 Peter about how to, you know, being a good wife. There's a whole section in 1 Peter about being a hard worker, being a respectable worker. And the whole book is all about, even in the midst of a culture that doesn't care about you, even when you're in exile in this culture, live such godly lives that people are, are, are amazed. Even when people oppress you, when people hate you, God is concerned about you living honorable, respectable lives. And I think that's interesting when we come up to these um, decision moments in our life. When we're, living, when we're in exile, we're not sure what to do. And we're wondering, God, where, why don't you care about which direction I should take? God says, well, I really, here's the direction I want you to take. I want you to be a good husband. God, what, what, which job should I take? This job? Should I take this job? God, should I go over here? Should I go over here? Should I do this? Should I do that? God says, well, first, I want you to be a good wife. First, I want you to be a hard worker. First, I want you to worry about your character. That's the thing God's most interested in. We're the ones concerned about which direction we should go. And we always wonder, what's the perfect direction God has for my life? And why doesn't he just tell me? Wouldn't it be much easier, God, if you just told me the perfect direction for my life? And I feel like God sometimes says, listen, Chad, because I pray this all the time. Listen, Chad, you can go either way, either direction that you're worried about. Either one is fine. I'm going to be with you whichever direction you choose. What I want you to do is just be holy. Work on being holy. Work on being a better husband. Uh, work on being, uh, you know, respectable and honorable. You worry about your conduct, and I'll take care of the direction that your life goes. And I really feel like if God, if, if the most important thing to God was that we made every single decision right and we made, and we stayed our life on the perfect course, if that was really God's most important thing for us, then he would come and he would tell us exactly what decision we should make. But I feel like God says, you're fine either way. Whichever decision, as long as you're praying about it and you're following me and you're with me, I'm going to be protecting you no matter what decision you make. Uh, there's two books without any reference to God. Esther's one book uh, of the Bible that doesn't have any reference to the name God or the word God. And the other book is Ruth, also in the Old Testament. And that's another book where people kind of debated over it. Well, should we even put this in the Bible? And actually, when they debated over it, they weren't debating on what to put in the Bible. They were debating whether maybe we should take it out because it doesn't mention God. But it, they've, they've always kind of been there. Everybody's always recognized them as authoritative. Authoritative. And it's interesting, these two books that don't have any reference to God, uh, Esther and Ruth, both of these books are about, uh, well, they're both about women, and they're both about, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but they're both about uh, these godly women who need to make these really impossibly difficult decisions, and God doesn't show up in a miraculous way and show, show them which direction they should go. But what is in common about both these books? Both of these women have impeccable character, and their character is really the central point of both stories. Esther's character, Ruth's character. That's the central thing. That's the important thing about both of them. What happens um, when we're, instead of worrying about our character, busy, busy worrying about uh, just making sure that we're taken care of and making sure that our lives are on the right track and that we're, we're busy always lifting ourselves up and taking matters into our own hands. Well, we can read what happens to Haman. Haman was the one who was doing all this. And the culmination of the whole story, and I didn't put it in your bulletin. I don't know why. I wanted to, the suspense or whatever. But the king has to make a decision here on what, what he needs to do. And he's a rash guy. He's filled with rage. So he has to leave for a little bit, and he has to cool down. And Haman, meanwhile, is, is pleading with Esther for his life. 
Uh, and it says just in verse 8, just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And in those days, you'd kind of, you just have a pillow and you'd kind of lay on the ground. So Esther's kind of laid off and they'd have the, the tables were on the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures like that, but that's how it would have been. So Esther's reclining and Haman's uh, like begging her for his life. And this is what the king walks into. And the king exclaimed, Will Haman even molest the queen while she's with me in this house? So Haman's not trying to do this, but, uh, you know, not trying to look. He's just trying to beg for his life. But the king sees this, and he's just like, oh, my gosh. As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So there must be some workers, some palace servants there. It says, then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits, which is 75 feet, stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. So here's Haman, the whole book, trying to manipulate things to justify himself and to lift himself up. And he's so mad, he can't, I was just thinking about this this week as I was studying these passages. And this whole thing started with this guy, Mordecai, who just wouldn't bow down to Haman. Like, that's, that's how this whole thing started. Uh, Haman was so irritated by this, he couldn't let it go. He couldn't just say, oh, you know what, forget it. It, it just bugged him so much, he ended up ruining his whole life because this one little thing was off in his life. And I think we, we end up doing that ourselves in our life. There's, there's this one little thing wrong, and it just, it, we, we try to take care of it, and we try to concentrate on it, and we end up ruining our whole lives trying to deal with this one little thing. And now what happens? Well, the, the very pole that Haman had set up in his yard to impale Mordecai on, now the king says, put him on it. And it's kind of like just desserts. We have a phrase, you're, you're hoisted with your own petard. I don't know what that phrase, you ever heard that phrase, hoisted with your own petard? Uh, that's basically what it means. Uh, Haman couldn't just let this one thing go, and now the destruction that he tried to cause someone else it ended up destroying him. That one thing he couldn't let go just ended up killing him. I think that's a danger for us as well. When there's that one little thing, uh, we need to learn to let that go and be okay with that kind of stuff. Be okay with not building ourselves up, puffing ourselves up, uh, trying to always worry about taking care of ourselves. Well, what, is this, what does this all mean for us? Well, it means a couple things. First, it, I think it means when we're living in exile, things are not pretty. And I've been arguing the last couple weeks that we're, we're finding ourselves living in exile now. And really, if you read First Peter, we're, we should have always been thinking that we're exiles. That should have always been our mindset is, this place is not our home. We're, our allegiance is to another kingdom entirely. Yes, we're, we're living in this culture, but ultimately we're not from here, and ultimately our hope is not in this place. But first of all, the, I think the lesson is, in exile, things are not pretty. We don't always see God. We don't always hear God the way we want to hear him, but God is always working. He is always behind the scenes and he's directing things and he's moving things and he's putting in place things even when we don't realize it. Uh, so what does that mean for us in exile? Well, it means we have to remember this is not our home. And while we're living here in exile, we need to be, the first thing I put is uh, lifting up God, not ourselves. Uh, living in exile means we're not lifting up ourselves because we don't care about the accolades of this place, of this world. We're living in exile. We don't care about what the, the, the country in exile says of us. We want to lift up God while we're here, not ourselves. That's the first thing. Um, it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, um, Jesus endured the same fate as that Haman did. Jesus was lifted up on a cross, and he was crucified by the world, by the, the powers of the world. And the difference is, of course, that Jesus was innocent. He didn't deserve it. Uh, and the big difference is that Jesus is suffering. He gives for us. Jesus was suffering. Jesus suffered on our behalf so that we could be set free. And the whole point of uh, Jesus coming was that he's going to set his people free by suffering the fate that we deserved. So 
uh, it says in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that people who hang on a tree have the curse of the law against them. And in fact, in the New Testament, they point this out and they says, uh, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed. And the point is that Jesus took our curse so we could be freed from the law. But that means we need to lift up God, not ourselves. We need to say, yeah, I, though I deserved what Haman got, perhaps, uh, Jesus took care of it for me to set me free. And we want to lift him up. We don't want to lift ourselves up. The second thing uh, it means to be people in, living in exile is that we need to be people of God. Living in exile means being people of God. And this means, uh, more importantly than making the right life decisions and making all the perfect choices in your life, more importantly than that, we have good character. That we work on instead, uh, like I said, being a good husband, being a good spouse, being a good child, being a good worker. Uh, that's what God's more interested in. So lifting up God, not ourselves, being people of God, and lastly, trusting in God to lift us up. And this is an important principle. Uh, Jesus has a, a parable where he says, when you go into a banquet, when you go to sit at a banquet table, don't sit yourself at the head of the table because maybe someone more important than you is going to come in and then you're going to have to get up with all your food and you're going to have to go to the end of the table and it's going to be embarrassing. He said, instead, sit at the low end of the table and if, if possible, uh, they'll bring you up to, uh, to a higher spot and you'll be honored. But don't take it in your own hands to honor yourself and make sure everybody knows how amazing you are. Trust in God to lift up yourself. In the climax of almost every great story in the Bible, you have kind of an ordinary person in a really tough situation, and they put just a radical trust in God to lift themselves up. Earlier in Esther, we read how uh, Esther makes this decision to go into the king, and she says, if I perish, I perish. This ordinary pers person forced to make this tough decision, but she says, but I'm going to have this trust that God's going to take care of things. She says, if I perish, I perish. Remember we read in the book of Daniel, uh, which also took place in exile. Daniel's friends, Mish Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were uh, being threatened to throw, be thrown into this furnace unless they worshiped at this idol. And the guy said, we're not going to do it. They said, the God we serve is, is stronger than your idols, and he's going to save us even from the fire. But then they say, but if God doesn't save us from the fire, we're still going to worship him. These ordinary people who just said, I'm not going to trust in myself to lift myself up. I'm going to just trust in God. You remember Jesus in the garden at the very end of his life, he's, he's in such agony, he's sweating blood, and he ends his prayer with, and he's praying to God, God, please let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go through the crucifixion. I don't want to bear the sins of the world on myself, he says. But he says, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. All the great stories of the Bible have just a, a, a person in a ridiculously tough situation, but saying, but I'm going to trust in God to take care of me. I'm not going to lift myself up. I'm going to let God take care of this. And it's difficult to put this into practice. Um, it's difficult to continue to be a hard worker uh, when your boss doesn't recognize you or doesn't care about you or when all your coworkers don't work hard or don't do anything. Isn't it hard to go in day after day and do a good job and see no one caring and everyone else uh, just you're having to pull the slack on everyone? It's difficult to do that stuff. It's difficult to continue to be a good spouse and a loving spouse and a respecting spouse when the person you're married to doesn't reciprocate. It's difficult to continue to do the right thing when no one seems to care, uh, when no one, you know, honors you or, or makes a big deal about it. It's difficult to do the right thing when you're hurt by doing the right thing. But here's where our faith becomes real. Here's where we really learn to trust in God, that God is going to lift us up. Because at the end of the day, we aren't supposed to be good people so that other people recognize it. We aren't supposed to be good people so that the other people around us will get their act together and they'll change. Uh, we're supposed to live respectable lives because that's who God calls us to be. Jesus gave his life for us. Now we live for him. Will God change other people, though? I, I struggled with this, and I'll close with this. Um, I, I remember, my, and I've shared this before, and my wife and I are in a good place in our marriage, so forgive me for bringing up this old stuff. 
But we went through periods in our, of our marriage that were very, very difficult. And I would say agonizing is a decent descriptive word. And, and I remember there was a, a, a point in our marriage where I was just, we were, I was so frustrated. And it had, probably had to do with money because I just get frustrated about that stuff. And Crystal and I have very different views on that stuff. And, and I just remember praying to God and, God and saying to God, God, can you even do anything about this? Because what I need you to do is I need you to change my wife. She, has to, she can't keep doing this. I, I can't live like this. And then I think, but God, will you even violate someone's free will? Can you even do that? And I remember just sitting there kind of hopelessly and helplessly thinking, I don't even know if, it's, if I should even be praying to you because I don't even know if you can even do anything. Uh, can you, you know, what's the point? And I was struggling with this. Will God really come in and change someone's heart? And, and I didn't really have an answer to that, but I found out the answer, and the answer is yes. God changes hearts all the time. That's kind of the main thing God wants to do in this world is change hearts. But God doesn't change people's hearts by us manipulating people. God doesn't change hearts by us um, nagging people and trying to coerce people and trying to um, get things, when we try to get things our way. God changes hearts when we lift people up in prayer and we just trust the results to God. Uh, because here's what I found out was true during those prayer times, that I needed to work on my trust of God. I'm, I'm sitting here so concerned about uh, what Crystal's going to do and that how she has to change, and I'm finding, well, I'm not really trusting in God at all here. I found that I needed things I had to work on, not only with my trust in God, but uh, with my own life. You say, but that's, that's hard. And the answer is, yeah, it's hard. It's absolutely hard. Living in exile is not easy, and it's not fun. But we're not putting our trust in this place. We're not putting our trust in even other people. We're putting our trust in someone that's unshakable and that has a solid foundation, that no matter what happens here, we worry about, okay, well, whatever happens here, I'm going to continue to follow you, and no matter what everyone else is doing, I'm going to continue to be the person that you called me to be. And that's going to be difficult, but that's why we get together as a church and we, and we cheer each other on and we say, yes, it's difficult, but we want to pump ourselves up and say, but I'm going to be here for you as you do this, as we go out into the world, as we go out into exile. Uh, let's strengthen each other in faith and let's worry about what God wants us to worry about and let him take care of the rest. Amen? Well, I, gotta, I went over, so I got to close now. Uh, but Lord, I pray that, um, I just want to, uh, pray that for specifically, I think, oh gosh, Lord, there's all sorts of areas where there's all sorts of struggles in this room, and I know, and I, I, I know some of them, but I don't, I don't even know the, the tip of the iceberg. And God, I have said difficult things today, things that aren't easy, and I don't want to pretend that they are easy, and I don't want this message to be a, a message of just telling people to suck it up. God, I, I need you to uh, do a work in all our hearts. Lord, I, 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 know, I know just the feeling of hopelessness and desperation when you, we, we don't know what direction we need to take. And Lord, I'm so glad that you also uh, because you lived a, a human life, you also know the struggles, what it feels like to not know the right direction, to, be, to feel like we're put on a path that we don't know where it's going to end. And Lord, you also know the struggles of having to live with people who are not perfect and who constantly frustrate your plans. And so God, I just pray for the people in this room today that that know what it feels like to live a life where it feels like other people are constantly frustrating our plans. Lord, I pray that you would just give us your heart today. Comfort us knowing that, uh, let us know that you know how that feels. And you, but also God, remind us that you know how it feels to have your plans frustrated because we're the ones who always frustrate your plans. And so, Lord, give us your heart. Give us your forgiving heart. Give us your loving heart. Remind us that we're also not perfect, that we're also living in exile. 
and that we all have to trust in you. But I pray that you would uh, continue to strengthen us, uh, continue to work, uh, do a work in our own lives. And Lord, I pray that we would just take these, pray these, take these next moments and these next a few days and weeks even, Lord, and help us to concentrate on who we are as your people. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, I, I give you permission today to point out the areas in my life where and instead of worrying about what other people are doing or what direction I need to take, Lord, would you point to the areas in my life where I need to work on my character or I need to work on my trust of you? And Lord, this is so difficult. And I don't say this lightly, but we're going to trust that you're going to take care of things. And Lord, I, all those burdens that we walked in with today, all those demands that we want to make about what our lives need to be and the direction our lives need to go, Lord, I want to lay those down at your feet. And I want to say as hard as it is to say, Lord, whatever your will is, let that be done. Whatever direction our lives take, Lord, I pray that you would be with us. And more importantly than the direction, Lord, I pray for our relationship to you, that you would continue to forgive us, continue to love us, and continue to walk with us. And we ask that you would continue to remind us that this is, this is not our home, that we are living in exile, but that you have a much better home prepared for us. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we walk through this old world and that uh, we are, are so excited and we look forward to the day where you greet us to our true home, where you bring us into our true home. And Lord, I, I just I could, can almost, I, I won't even be able to bear to hear you wrap your to have you wrap your arms around me and to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I, Lord, I couldn't even bear it. But Lord, help us, to, help us to focus on that moment. Help us to focus on, on just your love, your, your acceptance of us. And as we just give us confidence in this world, don't, don't let us lose hope the way the world lose hope, loses hope. Don't let us lose trust the way the world loses trust, Lord. Let the, let the world see that we have an unshakable hope. Lord, I'm grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. I'm grateful for the, for the sacrifice you made for me while I, while I was busy frustrating your plans, while I was busy um, running against you and arguing against you and going in a different direction, not even caring about you. Lord, I'm so grateful that you gave your whole life to me. I just, I just pray for those of us in here who are struggling right now that you would just give us your heart. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.